you know, the, the real key is to be able to put a position on and and resist the urge to to liquidate it, to take profits real quickly. You want to trade actively, cut your losses quickly and let your winners, you know, evolve and run over time. And your winners, you know, will turn out with good systems to be two, two and a half times bigger than your losing trades. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Hey everyone and welcome to another edition of Top Traders Unplugged where today Alan Dunn and I are joined by Brian Proctor who is a Managing Director at EMC Capital Advisors as part of our mini-series focusing on the one investment strategy that beat everything else in 2022, namely trend following and managed futures more broadly. First off, Brian, it's great to have you back on the podcast. It was all the way back in April and May of 2017 that you were last here along with your fellow Turtle Jerry, as well as your mentor, Richard Dennis. So thanks so much for joining us today. We really have been looking forward to catching up. How are things on the shores of Lake Michigan this morning? Everything is going fine here. Happy to be on the show once again and look forward to uh, getting grilled by you guys. <laughs> oh, we're not that <laughs> tough, are we? <laughs> now, Brian, before we dive into all of the various topics that we're going to discuss, we always like to set the stage uh, so that the audience knows a little bit about uh, your firm. And so perhaps you could share a few highlights because the industry of the sort of the history is a little bit interesting. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about that and the evolution and kind of where you are in terms of strategies uh, and, and business uh, as of today. Okay, uh, happy to do it. Uh, the firm was founded by uh, Elizabeth Cheval, and Liz got her start on the floor of the Board of Trade back in the uh, early to mid-80s, and um, she was chosen to be one of the participants in um, the Turtle Program, which was a mentoring program run by Rich Dennis and, Bill, and his partner, Bill Eckhart, and um, their goal was to um, try to see if they could train traders using set rules to become profitable traders. Um, and so Liz was um, one of the initial turtles chosen to be part of that program and did very successfully. And when um, when the program was over a few years later, she founded EMC Capital in 1988. Liz passed about a decade ago and the firm was um, taken over uh, by a guy, John P Krautsack, who's our president now. Uh, John joined EMC in 1995, and he also had extensive experience on the floor, working for some very big CTAs at the time, helping them run their investment strategies uh, before joining EMC. And, um, and uh, our director of research, Dave Poley, joined the firm in 2002. So he's been here over 20 years. Um, so you could see a lot of continuity in our firm. Uh, I joined in 2002 after uh, starting on the floor of the board in the Merck uh, in, the, in the early 80s, eventually running uh, the floor operations at each of, the, at each of those exchanges uh, for Rich Dennis and his company, CND Commodities. And then I also... Uh, joined the second wave of Turtles and traded for Rich in that program before branching off, running my own CTA, worked in New York for a while for a long short equity hedge fund, and uh, and then came back to Chicago and joined up with Liz in 2003. So um, that's it in a nutshell. You know, obviously being part of the Turtle program was 
really beneficial to learn from two of the real pioneers in our business and uh, the importance of managing risk, the importance of um, building robust systems and um, and just kind of the emotional side of trading too. you know, try to try to remove the emotion from trading so that you can run programs without trying to make subjective decisions on a daily basis. And in terms of strategy, how has that evolved since the early days of of, of Liz? Um, it's evolved considerably. Um, back in the, you know the early days of EMC, um, she was incorporating the tr more traditional breakout systems that she learned in the Turtle program. And over the next decade, I would say through in the late 90s, she incorporated uh, different types of trend following a momentum based system. So um, got away from uh, buying and selling around breakout points and um, really overhauled not only the trading systems that are, were in the program, but the amount of leverage used, um, the risk management protocols that got put into place. Um, the, the, you know, the industry really evolved from uh, a period where w the risk-free rate was, you know, very high when we started out as CTAs. And um, so the target, our targeted returns and volatility from the investors who were putting money with us, you know, were geared to be maybe three times the risk-free rate. So they were looking for higher returns, higher volatility. And over the years, the appetite for uh, those type of programs um, changed. And and so we had to evolve. And um, there's still a, you know, a considerable amount of risk that we take when we trade, but it's nothing like we were doing in the late 80s and early 90s. Sure. No, absolutely. And we'll dive into both of your strategies, certainly during this conversation. Now, um, Alan and I have created a list of topics um, and uh, we'll sort of interchange between us. Um, but as we normally do, I'm going to kick it over to Alan and to uh, to get it going. Alan. Thanks, Niels. Um, hi, Brian. Um, yeah, well, thanks for the introduction. It's, that that's gives us gives us a great sense of kind of the background on on EMC, and obviously a lot of the people there are steeped in the turtle trading experience. So, if you bring that kind of a, a initial experience to the present, um, and how would you kind of describe the philosophy in the sense that, it, that does it continue to be purely focused on trend as the primary source of return or do you I suppose are you adherents of the idea of using multiple sources of return um, or how would you characterize the, the, the philosophy more generally? I, I would say our inf uh, investment philosophy has stayed pretty much the same um, and that is that all the relevant market information is reflected in the price of whatever market we're looking at. And that uh, quantitative analysis is the most effective method to identify predictable trends in price. So uh, historical data shows that markets consistently trend and they yield identifiable and repeatable profit opportunities. So we're, you know, our objective was to develop and implement quantitative systematic strategies that um, obviously deliver long-term positive returns with low correlation to other asset classes. Um, but we're, we're always looking to all the models that we build and um, uh, they get re-optimized from period to period are always looking to capture directional price movement. And I mean, you mentioned kind of absolute return, low correlation. So in terms of kind of the, I suppose, there's a can be seen as a, a bit kind of trade-offs between generating return or generating um, diversification for equ equities or even crisis alpha. I mean, when, when you construct your portfolios, it sounds like you're first and foremost thinking from a return perspective and those other um, factors are, are secondary considerations. Is that fair to say? The returns are... Uh, you know, the first thing that we focus on, it's what everyone focuses on. They want to invest in something that that's going to gen, generate returns in a certain fashion. And when those and the returns that our particular strategy, as as most CTAs do, 
the returns are are just naturally um, divergent and and different than the return streams of other assets they have in their portfolio. So as long as we have, you know, long term positive returns that you know are what our investors are expecting, you know, that's the that's that's our main objective. Fair enough. And it's always a tough one to answer for, as a, as a manager, but I mean. From your experience of inter, uh, you know, interacting with other CTAs and other trend followers, is there anything you would point to as making you particularly different relative to your peers? Well, we're all looking to do very similar things. Um, but the difference between one CTA and the next and the next, um, there, every little thing that we do is going to be a little different from other CTAs. So I think the main areas that probably differentiate us a little bit are, um, first of all, we have a significant uh, allocation to commodity risk in our portfolio. So that's approximately 45 to 50 percent of the risk we uh, allocate across our strategies goes to commodity markets. Um, second of all, uh, we have a blend of systems in each of our programs. Um, the systems are based on two core concepts, trend following or range dependent systems and momentum systems, which are looking to capture, as I said, directional price movement. Um, we try to diversify these systems so that uh, when they're initiating and liquidating, they're they're doing it at different time frames and under different market conditions. So um and, and I would say we our systems have an average holding period of a 35 to 45 days, depending on the period. So I would say we fall in a medium term rather than a long term trend follower bucket. Uh, we have some systems that may hold a position on average only 15 days, um, other systems, you know, 35 to 50 days and, and uh, typically one or two real long term systems where will hold a position 100 days or, or longer. And just before we move on to the next bit, I mean, going back to the whole t experience and learnings as, as a turtle, you know, it's interesting you, you talked about, you know, managing risk, building robust systems, removing the emotion as kind of maybe the key elements as opposed to necessarily trend following. Was that the experience? Was it as much about the learning to manage risk or, or, as, or as much about imparting the philosophy of trend following, would you say? Well, the, you know, Rich and Bill were very adamant that, you know, um, if you don't manage your risk properly, um, you were not going to be a successful trader. So uh, that that was always one of the utmost first lessons they taught us. Um, but then the second was trend following that, you know, the, the majority of your systems, um, the winning percentages uh, you know, aren't going to knock anybody off their stools. You know, they're, they, you know, the, the real key is to be able to put a position on and, and resist the urge to, to liquidate it, to take profits real quickly. I, I know Bill used to say, you know, the, the, the one adage that you never get broke taking profits was, um, he said was absolutely wrong. You know, you want to, you want to trade actively, cut your losses quickly, and let your winners, you know, evolve and run over time. And your winners, you know, will turn out with good systems to be two, two and a half times bigger than your losing trades. And um, just one final one on this one. I mean, one of the debates that's kind of come up, you know, on this podcast and more generally is, is I guess, kind of linked to volatility sizing and, and maybe all of that stuff. But But it's kind of the it seems like the treatment of uh, open equity is different to the treatment of kind of your trading stake. Um, whereas more, you know, it's like if you have open equity in position, you should let that run and keep those positions open. Whereas maybe the more typical managers now don't make that differentiation. They manage all kind of dollars equally. Is, it, is, that, is that a fair characterization, would you say? And then what's your perspective on, on, on that whole debate? Yeah, um, I think it's a fair characterization. Um, we have changed uh, one of the uh, things in our risk management. Um, it's It does take into account uh, at the portfolio level, open trade equity and the size of unliquidated profits that we're building 
um, when trends are occurring and and when the program uh, has a sizable amount of risk on. So there is an algo that we have in all of our programs that there's really two elements to it. There's a profit element when we reach certain thresholds in terms of profit um, based on open trade equity and the account size. And the other element is a time element. So you need trends to mature a little bit before you want to start um, scaling back the positions. So that's a little bit of a departure from what we used to do, um, where we would let our profits run until the trade uh, ended by, you know, reversing the long-term trend. So, you know, that particular algo kicks in during highly profitable periods where, you know, CTAs with our kind of right tail skewness, that it's those periods that this algo cuts back positions, locks in profits, and really gets risk more in line with usually what's happening during those periods is increases in volatility in the portfolio. So, Rather than look at, you know, when we're initiating trades, obviously the volatility of that market det- helps determine the sizing, the number of contracts that we're going to trade. And as vol increases, even if all of our systems, say, are long in a particular market, um, you know, there's a max risk per market um, when you initiate the trade. But then as vol increases over the life of that trade, Obviously, risk is increasing, and we don't reduce positions solely based on increases in volatility. That's what we consider good vol. There's good vol and bad vol. Good vol is when you're positioned correctly and volatility is increasing, and um, that helps drive the returns of trend-following and momentum-based CTAs. But the algo that we put in place uh, gives us a way to gradually kind of get risk more in line with the current vol, take some profits off and kind of cushion those periods where, um, where when trends are ending, we're giving back some of the profits. Yeah, no, that's certainly an interesting departure, which I'm sure we could have a whole podcast discussing, but we are not going to do that today, Brian. Now, one of the questions that we've discussed with all our guests is kind of a little bit, you know, kind of the, 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 you know, the role to some extent uh, that our strategy should play in a portfolio in the sense that we know that by including them, um, we or the, the investors achieve a higher uh, risk-adjusted return. And, and in lack of a better measure, we're just identifying that as, as sharp. Uh, however, we also know uh, that a lot of managers have taken it on uh, themselves to try and improve the sharp of their strategies um, because, as we know, it can be a hard strategy to hold on to. And we've heard different perspectives of that and, and feel free to, to talk to us about that. But I want to add one more thing to your uh, particular um, question. And that is, if you want to stay true to trend following as clearly you have, what are the things you can do in a sense to, to enhance the risk adjusted return but without departing and adding other things just for the sake of improving the shop. So feel free, Brian, to go wherever you want with, with this. Okay. Um, well, the role um, that I would think CTAs have in a in a you know uh, an investment portfolio would be number one, just to add diversification. Definitely different return streams. Um, as you mentioned, it, it, that improves the overall portfolio returns and and should lower risk. So that's always key. But for us, um, we've actually have one program uh, that uh, remains true to the higher risk, more trend following element. But we also have developed other programs that looked at Uh, building a program with a smoother return stream. So it it incorporated long-only elements in equities and bond holdings and um, commodity holdings, such as always having a long gold holding in the portfolio. So those programs were designed um, with a lower targeted risk return profile, uh, lower drawdowns, and just a more palatable return stream for the investor. So we gave the investor, the choice, what type of investment they wanted to make, what made sense for them on the amount of risk they're comfortable with. And 
how, you know, how either one of those types of programs fit into their investment objectives. I just want to stay on this for, for a little while longer. And I'm thinking, yeah, no, I mean, I can see if you're adding some long only stuff or some long buyer stuff, uh, I can see that makes a difference. But if, if, if and I and maybe I'm speculating here, but have you also had tr- or tried to see how you could improve, say, the risk adjusted profile without departing from pure long short diversified trend following? Or is that just simply too difficult uh, nowadays? Well, we've um, for a long time we've had a little bit of a long bias to the long trades in the portfolio. So we're initiating long positions as opposed to short positions in our more traditional trend following program uh, that has helped improve returns. You know, the the biggest Mm -hmm. winners seem to always be uh, on the long side, although you can point certainly to, to short trades that were just phenomenal, you know, shorting the energy markets, uh, you know, a number of years ago when the pandemic started, things like that, you know, being short the base metals or whatever. So, you know, the, there are times when the short trades definitely are the outperformers in the program, but historically, you know, decade after decade, it's been the long trade. So you can always add a slight bias to the long positions, taking them a little bit bigger than the short positions. And the other thing I think is um, when you're doing research and you're you're looking to stay abreast of how markets are changing and evolving from year to year and decade to decade, your process for re-optimizing your systems using the new data inputs from year to year is important. So our, our systems all look at a combination of return metrics over varying time frames. So we're say, looking at at return over the entire historical price data that we have, and then combining it with, say, a five-year or a seven-year Sortino number to improve the risk-adjusted return. So um, it definitely, all of our our systems have a a short look-back window as part of the equation to try to um, adapt and evolve um, those systems as markets uh, change over time. Yeah, no, that's interesting. It's um, it's rare that I've come across people who've actually done what you said, this thing about actually giving long trades a, a little bit more uh, weight, even though um, we all know as managers that when we look at our trade stats, I mean, by far the most profitable trades uh, have been the long-sided trades. And I don't know, I mean, part of that is probably because things like equities, things like bonds, at least up until uh, last year, you know, we're in some phenomenal uh, uptrends. Uh, so, um, but but it is very interesting to hear. I appreciate that. Alan, where do you want to go next? Yeah, well, maybe just to to move into the some of the research and enhancements um, <clears throat> in the program over time. Um, so it does sound like that that the program has evolved fairly materially from from maybe the, the original program. You mentioned, you know, that I guess the change in the leverage and and the risk protocols um it sounded like maybe was was that driven by as much maybe the institutionalization of managed futures and kind of the um uh, you know the investor uh, requirements but um you know but definitely useful to get a sense on what are the things that can be enhanced in a trend following program over time obviously a lot of the time you hear with trend it's a, the importance about maintaining stability in the system but useful to get your perspective on what things can be uh, evolved over time in, in this type of program well the the things that evolve in the trading systems we stay our systems stay pretty set right now unless you know, we go for a number of years in a row where a trading system just is always at the bottom of the barrel, um, so to speak, in terms of uh, return, absolute return, risk adjusted return, just doesn't seem to be uh, functioning properly anymore. Then obviously that system will have to be altered or removed from the portfolio. But we haven't done that in, in over, you know, a long, long time. Uh, the same core logic for our systems Um, both the trend following and momentum have stayed in place. What changes over time is the parameter sets of the systems. Um, So, uh, you know, think of it as each system basically has a a few parameters, uh, the fewer the better, 
that tell you how to initiate a position. Uh, you have a few parameters on how to liquidate the position. Obviously, there's a max loss every for each system every time you initiate a trade. Uh, but more often, there's uh, one of the other system liquidation parameters that kicks in. You know, we very rarely, maybe less than 15% of the time, hit the hard stop on when a system initiates. So it's some other liquidation criteria. Um, and equally as important uh, has been the evolve uh, evolution of what parameters you include in the systems that block you from taking trades in certain environments. So we have a couple of parameters in each system that's looking at the historical volatility in each market that we're trading and looking back over X amount of days. It could be 200 days or or longer. And if the volatility in that particular market for that system reaches a threshold, say it's above, it's in the top 15% of the volatility looking back over X period of time, um, each system has a filter based on vol that'll stop it from trading because research shows that when you trade in a very highly volatile uh, market environment, you're more often to take a loser and you're more often to hit the hard stop. So um, you just, uh, you, you you wait till uh, the dust settles, so to speak. It may take a week, a couple of weeks for uh, the volatility in that market to abate a little in the system to then allow trading to happen. Um, so each one of our systems has a has a vol filter, and they and they vary from system to system because we don't want to have such restrictions that we miss a trend. We always want at least one or two systems kicking in, even in really highly volatile times, um, so that we don't miss putting a position on and having to tell our investor, he said, geez, why didn't you have this market on? And we said, well, the vol was too high. And he said, I'm paying you guys to take risk and manage risk and not miss those trades. So, um, but but each, each system has uh, a different vol filter. Um, each system has uh, what we call a range dependent system, which um, uh, and an open range filter where the market has to be moving in the direction for either the initiation or liquidation that has to occur. So um, we look at the average daily vol in that market, which for us is a it's a pretty short look back window. Uh, we determine volatility looking back basically over only a couple of weeks. So the way we look at vol in each market is very reactive to changes over the last couple of weeks in any given market. So that, you know, that's another thing I think that differentiates us from other CTAs is that very short look back window in how we look at volatility in a market to, to size trades and to um, decide whether we should be putting positions on in, in different market environments. Uh, you mentioned the average hold periods have been about 35 to 45 days, which I just say would put you probably, I guess, a bit faster than maybe a lot of the medium to long term trend followers. Um, and you know, I think that most of the research would, would indicate that being slower has, has been better over the last time, or at least being faster has been more challenging. Have you guys looked at that research? And I guess, have you settled on 35 to 40 days from a philosophical perspective, or as just what you see as being the most effective uh, looking at the data across all of the markets? Well, uh, the truth is the longest term trading systems have the highest absolute returns. Um, so, uh, you know, putting on a position and letting the trend go as far and as long as possible, uh, when there are big trending markets, there's no question that the longest term trend following systems are going to have the best returns, but they're going to have the best returns with more deviation and bigger drawdowns associated with them. So, in our perspective, we like to have multiple trends or multiple systems, sorry, um, that attack trends in a different way. Um, our shorter term systems will get in and out and back in and out over over a time continuum, but that helps improve, you know, the Sharp and or Sortino numbers of the overall, it's really how you blend the systems together that determines the return stream. So we could put all of our risk in the longest term systems and 
we'd have much bigger drawdowns, much higher standard deviation, and probably have our program be less palatable to most investors. So it's it's uh, it's really the blend of systems, and the and the average duration will change over time. You know, our our shortest term system, you know, in a five year period, might be on average have a holding period of eighteen days, and uh, for the next trading year or two, it it might be as low as twelve to fifteen percent or fifteen days. So that number thirty five to fifty will, you know, change. Not substantially, but it'll vary from period to period. Very good. And and just quickly on 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 the that you mentioned that the very short look back on vol the two weeks. Um, I mean, what what kind of influences your your decision making there? Is that kind of coming back to the risk management mindset that if there is a sudden shift in the vol landscape, you want to be cognizant of that? Or I mean, you know, obviously, I guess if you have a just a one day big move, it can very much skew kind of the 10 day measure. Whereas if you had a longer term measure, you, you might, might be less reactive, but um, yeah. What, 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 what drove that decision? Um, that, that, that's something that goes way back to the turtle trading days, really. Uh, it, and that is if vol is increasing in a market, it could be a one day thing, but more often than not, if you get a big spike in price, that, you know, there's something's occurred um, to make that market react that way. So if vol is increasing, if we have all systems with a position on and it's going in our favor, great. If it's bad vol, then we're probably being pretty quick to liquidate at least some of those systems. But the purpose of of making sure that we're reactive to changes in vol is for new initiations because we're going to be sizing our position on the new volatility in that market rather than on, say, an 80-day look back where it would smooth out and you pretty much be sizing today's trade as the same as you did weeks ago. So, you know, obviously with more vol, we're taking less contracts. Uh, we normalize the risk in each system across the market. So um, if market vol is picking up, and we're initiating a trade, we're not getting filtered out by the vol filter, we will be taking um, less contracts and just managing around those contracts around um, the current volatility. Yeah, no, I want to stay a little bit on, on, on this topic because you mentioned earlier on that you kind of focus on two core concepts uh, in your systems, namely trend following and momentum. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the difference uh, or how you define the difference between the two and how they conceptually uh, are, are different? Yeah, I mean, like I said, they're always, uh, every system's looking to capture directional price movement. So for us to diversify um, the program, we like to diversify in as many ways possible. So uh, in the markets we choose, um, globally, uh, commodities, financials, um, and trading systems. So the the trend following systems are based on, um, well, they're looking at uh, confirming the current price over a, a few discrete time frames, so we're looking at to confirm that over a long term look back, it's in an up or down trend, and then a medium term look back and a short term look back. So, uh, you know, uh, we may be looking at a 180 day price, um, for, you know, the current price to 180 days ago, and then to 40 days ago, and then to 15 days ago, and if we're above a certain portion of the range, um, that confirms for us that uh, a trend is in place and we will be initiating a trade uh, if if the filters don't keep us out. Um, so, uh, and then as far as the, you know, we have a couple of different trend following ones. So it's really the liquidation criteria then that differentiates the holding periods. Um, one of the trend following systems is quicker to liquidate and then reinitiate the trade, and the other one is designed to to hold a position maybe thirty five to forty five days, um, whereas the shorter term one will be targeting more of a fifteen to twenty five day holding period. Um, and then the the momentum systems are very different in the way they initiate. Uh, they are looking at 
um, the t a time weighted analysis of the most recent daily data. So we're looking we're looking basically at the le maybe the last two or three weeks of daily data, and we're looking at two things, two different types of momentum systems. One, we're looking at uh, the closing price prices in a market to identify that a trend is basically that a trend is emerging. Um, so the more positive closes you have looking back over various time slices, the more likely you are that a trend is beginning to emerge. So that's one type of momentum system. And then the other one uh, is just looking at the at the speed and the magnitude of price action from day to day. And if um, volatility is picking up and prices are accelerating in one direction or another at a, at a rapid rate, uh, that system tends to kick in. So um, what it does is diversifies for us the points where we're initiating and liquidating trades in the markets we're trading. Um, there may be periods where we have only one system that's either long or short. Uh, we have periods where two or three systems may kick in and have a uh, trade on. And if a market's really trending, you know, typically we'll have four, all four systems on. But it really diversifies where you get in and where you get out uh, of trades. And each system has an equal risk weighting. So um, there's no bias towards, you know, no heavier risk weighting to the longer term system um, because, you know, data shows that you never know from what time frame to the next that which system is going to generate the best returns. Uh, it's it's pretty random, but um, you know, overall, having an equal risk weighting, you know, ensures that we're not overdoing it and and say the the, the system that's going to hold a position for a hundred and hundred and fifty days, something like that. Yeah, there was a couple of things I was really intrigued by uh, when I read through some of your stuff uh, in preparing for this. And of course, I don't want you to share any of the secret sauce, which I'm sure you wouldn't anyways. Uh, you talk about uh, something you've developed, uh, like a super value that you're looking at. Um, but also, um, you you talk about two things that you are looking to improve. And one of them stood out to me as something I said, well, what does that really mean? One of them was the risk-adjusted returns. That's perfectly fine. I think we understand that. The other one you mentioned called is the technical logic of the system. Can you, what, what does that really what does that mean and, and how, how is that Im important uh, to, to your process? Well, each system has a fitness metric or a super value um, that it's optimized to. So we can, we can change the various performance metrics that go into the, the algorithms that, that build the parameter sets for each of those systems. And if you change the core logic, say you're 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 blending a, a return element with, uh, say, uh, a risk adjusted element like Sortino, that'll give you a system that has a certain roadmap in terms of return generation. Whereas, uh, if you decide you want to add maybe another system to the program and reallocate the the risk uh, instead of four systems with twenty five percent, five systems with twenty. Then you take another system and you look at the return element with, say, the concept of um, efficiency, uh, meaning how if a if a if a market trends from point A to point B, uh, how much of that trend do you capture? So that gives you a different set of performance data and, and a different a different definitely different target for that particular system. So that's that's what I that's what we mean by changing the core logic. It would be what goes into the fit to fitness metrics, and how does that change the return profile of that system? Number one, and then even if you change the return profile of that system, you still have to blend it with the other systems to see the effect on the portfolio. So, so that's the change in the core logic, whereas the other um, changes from period to period are really just how does the data affect the system that's already in place 
and change the parameter sets. So th- those are the differences. And, and that was actually just my follow-up before I hand it back to Alan, is in the sense that you have this adaptive process, which, you know, frankly, the firm I work for, we also are adaptive in our parameter selection, uh, so to speak. Uh, but of course, a lot of people you know, don't believe in that and kind of stick with the same parameters. Um, and, and that seems to work as well. Uh, but how do you, um, how do you, how do you see the importance of, of your methodology? Uh, I imagine it's something that has come, uh, you know, later in life, so to speak, this adaptive nature, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. And, and how does it, um, I mean, maybe you can describe it a little bit, but also how does it, it help, uh, in your goal to be, you know, reliable, predictive, robust, some of the things that I noticed. So, the, you know, in the in the reoptimization process that all of our systems undergo on a, a yearly basis. So uh, by that, I mean, in Q1, we'll reoptimize, say, a, a, a short-term trend-following system. In Q2, we'll look to reoptimize the parameters of the long-term momentum system and so forth. So we stagger the reoptimization process of our systems from one quarter to the next. So we're not making wholesale changes to all the systems at one time, say on January 1st of every year. When we're looking to reoptimize the systems, you know, we could do it on a shorter time basis than that, but really there's not enough data points. Um, so can you can you state your question again? I kind of lost track. Yeah, no, of my... no, no, that that's perfectly fine. No, I was just it's it's I was more curious about how you feel the process you use a, a walk forward process, how that helps you achieve your goal uh, in a sense um if if you could just sort of talk talk about that um you know again without uh getting into to to the secret sauce um because I do think that maybe I mean I think definitely Parameter picks are important, uh, without a doubt. But I also find that the methodology of how people go about go about changing them. For example, the fact that you mentioned this that you don't do it all in one go. Um, I've certainly come across people who do it all in January, right? So those kind of things uh, seem to uh, to be relevant. Yeah, yeah. So to get back on track, uh, the the forward walk um, out of sample testing that we do. Um, is very important because when we're looking at um, creating um, systems that are reliable, uh, reproducible, so that our investors can have confidence that we're going to perform the way they expect during different market environments, that forward walk methodology is very important. We, you know, we'll we'll reoptimize a trading system and then. Um, We'll compare at the end of that period, we can compare the actual trading results to the hypothetical out of sample. And as long as the trading system is very close to performing in real time, what the out of sample track record is showing you're doing, then you know, or at least you have a better degree of confidence that what you're doing is reliable and reproducible. If you start to see in real trading, um, something that's diverging from the expected out of sample returns, then then that's something to for the in- investment committee to discuss. Sure, oh, absolutely. Alan, where are we going next? Well, <clears throat> just maybe to pick up on, on on one of the points here, just so so I'm clear. You know, when you talk about the core logic, is is that kind of the overall uh, investment objective? You know, you talked about whether you want absolute return or risk adjusted returns or I guess sharp would be in that and um, is is that 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 idea and, and and what might might prompt you to change that at some point I guess when you when you say you're a systematic quantitative CTA manager um, there's always those discretionary things that you're doing in research that determines what makes you what makes your systematic quantitative approach maybe a little bit different than other other CTAs. So our goal is to have trading systems much, much like a multi-CTA fund to fund. You know, you, you hire certain CTAs with certain return expectations and you blend them with other CTAs to, to build that uh, multi-manager program. 
The same is true for EMC with multiple systems. We want to make sure that the roadmap that we have for each system is going to generate returns, you know, with positive expectation, but they're going to differ from system to system so that uh, the overall effect is a certain rate of return um, based with a, a risk element and a, and a certain drawdown expectation. So it's really the discretionary things that go on in the background. It's like, what kind of, what kind of a s- types of systems do we want to blend together to get where we want to go? Good stuff. Uh, I, I guess maybe it's good, uh, good segue into something that we've talked uh, with everybody about, had a good bit of debate about, which is the number of markets traded. And, and you know, we've ha- heard kind of different views on the value of adding more and more markets, you know, um, some managers now trading hundreds of markets, others trading more to kind of 80 to 100 type of traditional macro markets. What's your perspective on the mirrors and the costs and benefits of trading lots and lots of markets? Well, it's, you certainly, um, there really is no right number of markets, in my opinion. We're, we're currently trading somewhere in the seven, you know, 70 some odd markets. Um, we definitely have a, a quite a few markets that we're looking actually to add to the portfolio. So when you do, um, obviously, you want to look at, well, at least we're going to look at a number of different factors. Um, obviously, first and foremost, are they liquid enough for the AUM that we're trading? Uh, if they are, great. Then they can, then they can get um, a certain risk weighting, which every market in our portfolio gets its own risk weighting, anywhere from a fully weighted risk market, which is a one, down to less liquid markets might have a 0.1 um, risk weighting in them. And that's primarily because of their liquidity. Um, we're still trading markets like um, lumber and orange juice and uh, oats and things like that, where the liquidity in those markets is smaller, so we can't take full position sizes, but we want to keep them in the market or keep them in the portfolio because quite honestly, you never know from year to year what the best market in terms of profitability is going to be. And the, over the last uh, several years, the big, some of the biggest trenders have been things like palladium and orange juice and lumber and hogs and markets that, you know, we're still able to f- trade nimbly and so those are the ones that add meaningful profit attributions by uh, <laughs> by the end. But um, so liquidity is definitely a, a consideration. Um, the, the correlation of the market that you're going to add to the sector that you're looking at. So one of the markets we're looking at right now, say, would be iron ore. So we would put that in the base metal category or sector of our portfolio. So we'd have to look at how much risk we want to keep allocated in the base metals and maybe reduce a little bit of the risk in the other markets that we're trading, you know, nickel, copper, zinc, aluminum, and to add that market. So you would have to adjust the market weightings a little bit, but, you know, but if it really does have non-correlation and is a market that's dissimilar to everything else that you're trading, then it's a, it's a good addition to the portfolio. So, um, another thing that that we look at when we're determining to, how to add markets or how to weight markets in the portfolio is that particular market's return stream will we apply the trading systems that we use in that market. Um, so historical performance, there's some markets that that are more difficult to trade successfully than other markets. They move from point A to point B in a much choppier fashion. And that's another reason why we have a blend of systems because if there's more choppy markets, we want to kind of be getting risk in and out and back in and out of those markets as they chop along. Um, so we look at the the return expectation for that market and um, some markets just trend better than others, that more linear type trends, uh, less hiccups along the way. So a market that has that kind of return expectation, we can give a little higher uh, weighting to. So, you know, we're always looking to add 
markets that would improve um, the diversification of the portfolio and the return expectations of each program. Niels, I know it's a yeah, favorite well, topic of yours. Um. <laughs> well, since you took one of mine, which was <laughs> number of markets, I'm going to take risk management at it. <laughs> no, I'm I'm just curious because I think it is an important uh, topic that we want to uh, talk to you about as well. And that is just how do you think of, of risk and, and what are some of the key ways of you uh, managing um, the risk in, inside the, the strategies? Um, yeah, well, as I mentioned at the outset, risk is probably the most important thing that a CTA does. Um, you can have a marginally good blend of trading systems or one trading system, and if you manage risk properly, you you know you can you can generate positive returns. But uh, so for us, we're we manage risk really at every level of the investment program. So um, I guess at the start with the our trading systems, as I mentioned, there's always each system has a max loss for each trade in every market that's automatically generated once we initiate the trade. And and different systems um, have different max loss thresholds. So um, some systems, as I mentioned, were, are designed to accept a little more volatility, um, a little bit bigger drawdowns. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, every system has a max loss associated with it. Every market has a limited amount of risk that it can take at initiation. So the more aggressive, higher risk-weighted markets in, um, say, our traditional trend-following program will risk um, maybe a half, a per, half of 1% per trade. Every, you know, every system is going to have a little bit of different risk associated with it. Um, obviously, then we're looking at volatility of the markets with what I said was a short look back window, uh, open, uh, you know, um, the open high, low close over the last, uh, in the true range over the last two weeks. And volatility then gets built into building new initiations. So um, as vols increasing, smaller position sizes is uh, in more consolidated periods, we'll take a bigger number of contracts uh, when we're initiating a trade. And then, obviously, by limiting the amount of risk that can be taken in any one market or one sector, you know, when you look at max risk in the portfolio and you take the max risk, say, in the markets within the energy sector. So we're currently trading six global energy markets. Um, when you look at the risk weighting for each of those markets and you add them together and you divide it by the the total risk that could be allocated across the whole portfolio, you'll get a percentage of risk that can be allocated to that particular sector. So in the energy sector, it happens to be like 10 or 11% in our trend following. So that's the mass, max risk at initiation. But then again, as I mentioned, you know, you might get uh, a period where, say, when you're you're long the energy markets in, in anticipation of conflict or a war breaking out, and then vol jumps twenty five or thirty percent. Well, the risk in all of your current positions is has increased by that much too. So, the overall risk in the program at that point might be you know fifty percent more than it was before uh, in terms of the total risk from day to day. But that's good vol, that's driving good returns. And if we reach the portfolio threshold that I mentioned, where our open trade equity is growing, our profitability is high, um, then the scaling mechanism will start kicking in and getting those positions back in line to mirror what the current risk in that market is. So I guess that's one of the big departures is this concept of utility and marginal utility. So utility would be the satisfaction that an investor gets from going from up 5% to up 10%. Well, utility is going up for the investor every step of the way. But say going from 15% to 20%, utility is still going up, but the marginal utility or the amount of satisfaction he's getting from going from 15 to 20 is decreasing each percentage along the way. And he's much more interested in preserving those gains and 
not experiencing the big drawdown that that could occur with a trend reversal and kind of locking in that profitability. So that's really the concept that overlays the risk management at the portfolio level is how far along the way do we want trends to go before we start scaling back? And it can be gradual. It can be maybe 2% or 3 or 4% of all the positions in the portfolio on a day-to-day basis. Or if we get uh, a big spike where, say, a, a program is up 3 or 4% on the day, we could get um, a significantly bigger uh, scaling uh, effect. In the most aggressive scenario, I guess, if you're up you know, 10, 15, 20, 25%, we can, we can cut back the positions in our, in our more traditional trend following program up to 60, 70, 75% of the original position. So uh, it can be meaningful, especially uh, it, it, it's been very helpful over, you know, the last, uh, well, we in, started in doing this uh, risk management scaling in the late 2000, 2000, right before in 2008, really. So, you know, it definitely has its pros and cons. Um, by implementing it, you're you're sacrificing some up to, upside potential. So in real explosive periods, we might underperform some of our peers. You know, we'll still be putting up returns that are comparable, but we might be underperforming. And conversely, then when the reversal periods come, uh, we might be outperforming because of this mechanism. So that's, I guess, one of the things that you asked earlier, what differentiates us? I would say that's definitely one of them. Sure. No, it's very interesting because as, as, as you know, we, we often talk about how trend following kind of encapsulates human behavior in general, but here you've kind of taking sort of one specific bias, human bias into, uh, into a little bit more of the forefront. Uh, so yeah, very interesting indeed, Brian. Thanks for sharing that. Alan, do you want to do one more round of um, topics and then we'll slowly? Well, maybe on. just, I mean, useful to get your perspective on, on markets generally. I mean, liquidity in particular, but, but even more broadly than that. Obviously, you've been involved in markets since since the you know 1980s, been on the floor. Now it's everything's gone electronic. You know, do you think, obviously, some things don't change in some senses, trend following, still working, obviously other things are changing. What, 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 what do you think is different now? And specifically, how do you think the liquidity of markets is maybe relative to, to what it was going back over time? Well, I, I think markets are more liquid than they used to be. Um, the, I think the real difference is the flow of information <laughs> is certainly much quicker than it certainly was in the 80s and 90s, where unless you were on the floor, um, the information flows that you would see um, just from the various trading desks and the hand gestures into the pits and who, what big firms were doing what. That was your inside information when you were on the floor. Um, uh you know, in today's environment, obviously with everything electronic, uh, there's a lot more liquidity, but it's um, markets tend to react to news much quicker than they used to, um, for better or for worse. Um, sometimes for worse, you, you know, an unexpected news story can come out, and 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 a lot of CTAs and and hedge funds are positioned the wrong way you're going to have a cascade of liquidation orders pushing the trade against you. So, um, you know, I guess that's another reason why we prefer to have a blend of systems, some that are shorter term in nature so that when those market moves occur, uh, where we have nice trends in place, and then there's something that causes a steep reversal in the trend, we want to be pretty nimble in liquidating at least part of our position because, you know, if we waited for longer time frames, just the drawdown would be bigger. And, uh, you know, we've learned over time that, that if a lot of market participants are positioned the wrong way, that those liquidations tend to <laughs> continue over longer and longer periods of time, and it just gets more painful. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, uh, absolutely, uh, completely uh 
uh, acknowledge that uh, that pain. Now, the um, uh, another thing, um, a little bit maybe related to pain uh, here, Brian, and that is we always want to hear from uh, from our guests. Um, you know, what's the one thing that uh, they hear about trend following that they really uh, disagree with? So I'm going to ask you the same. If there's one particular thing that you hear people say about trend following that you think and maybe have for 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 a while that that you completely disagree with. Well, I th- I think the more astute the investor is, um, the better. But uh, there, you know, there's times when I've heard people say uh, either oh, all you guys are doing the same thing. You know, I could just throw a dart and pick one of you. And, you know, wouldn't make any difference. Um, I think that's not correct. Um, uh, I, I, you know, um, trend following, I've heard it, you know, multiple times throughout the last 30 some odd years that trend following is dead. Trend following really doesn't work. Um, I can, you know, if I want to do that, I can just flip on a moving average and be either long or short based on whether it's above or below a moving average. Um, you know, all those kind of things, um, have, you know, maybe a grain of truth in them. Um, but, uh, for the most part, it's frustrating, especially when you know that, you know, long-term positive returns definitely add diversification and benefits to a, a portfolio. So people that just say, no, you're too, you know, you're too volatile for me or, you know, too volatile for our portfolio. It just, um, I don't know. I, I don't agree with that. <laughs> no, that's fair enough. I, it is quite interesting actually, Brian, when, when, you know, when, when I hear you talk and, and, and obviously you've explained a, a lot of things today and, uh, and so have all the other guests, uh, in, in this series. Um, and it is quite interesting when you hear how much work, how much testing, how many ideas uh, gets tried before we find the things we believe work. And of course, they're all a little bit different uh, as well. So I hope that makes it pretty clear to people that what we do is certainly not simple uh, or, or easy um, in any way. Yeah, shape or form. I, I was going to say, it's, it's funny. I, I was just thinking of all the testing and all the things that we tried to do over the years to to devise and develop a counter trend system that would counteract, say, if we were we had a, a lot of long positions, a lot of risk exposure in the portfolio, come up with a system that would be a counter trend system that would help dampen the risk and capture those tr- reversals. And uh, very, very difficult to find uh, a trend reversal system that, for at least for us, that worked. And what that eventually evolved into was this algorithm that scales back positions rather than allocate more of the capital and um, margin money to putting on short positions <laughs> than, you know, so it is a process that, you know, the light bulb goes on and you say, you know, instead of this, let's try this. And um, yeah, it's, it is definitely an ongoing process and you can't, well, I, I shouldn't say you can't rest on your laurel. Some some traders don't trade don't change what they've done and have remained successful. But we we like to look at how to improve things from period to period. Yeah, no, absolutely. The last thing I just wanted to ask you, Brian, was really um, obviously uh, as I stated in my introduction, in twenty twenty two, trend following was really the one strategy that stood out. Um, uh, looking now, we're kind of almost halfway through uh, 2023. What what are you what are you getting excited about, um, so to speak? Could be you know uh, whether you've had um, more productive conversations in the first few months of this year after last year or whatever it might be. But what are you excited about uh, as you look into the rest of the year? And and are there any concerns on on your radar for for us as an industry? Yeah, it's interesting if I'm excited or I'm a little nervous. I <laughs> it's always interesting cuz obviously nobody knows what's coming next whether it's uh you know a resurgence of inflation over the next 12 6 to 12 months to 18 months or uh whether it's um some issue with, you know, debt around the world. Um 
it's it's definitely an environment where you want to have uh, something in your portfolio that's trading some of these unique markets, trading in commodity markets, trading interest rates, the ability to get short equities. I mean, it's uh, as I look into 2023, there's a lot of uncertainty, um, and that's why I'm glad that we're that we're not discretionary traders because that would really be difficult. So um, I like the quantitative approach that we take. It helps helps us sleep at night. We know, you know, looking at stress testing, you know, what the potential, you know, outlier risk is. And, you know, when we look at our, our, our daily internal VAR that we're calculating for each market and each portfolio on a day-to-day basis, actually right now it's, um, it's fairly high historically. Um, so we do have a lot of positions on in, in various sectors. So we are we are seeing trends, and we're definitely seeing increases in volatility across a lot of different markets and sectors. So you, you know we're just glad that for the investor investor base that we have, that people are starting to look at systematic commodity trading strategies a little bit more to add to the portfolios. So um, you know we're optimistic, but we've always been cautiously optimistic for. <laughs> from period to period. (laughs) Yeah, no, that makes uh, perfect sense. Brian, this was really a a wonderful uh, conversation. Great to have you back on the podcast. And thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your insights uh, with us. And we hope, of course, that we can do that sometime again in the future. And to all of you listening in today, I hope that you were able to take something from today's conversation onto your own investment journey. And if you did, please share these episodes with your friends and colleagues. From Alan and me, thanks so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you on the next episode of Top Traders Unblocked as we continue our deep dive into the CTA industry. And in the meantime, go check out the show notes for this episode and all the other resources you can find on the website. And of course, not least, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.